Welcome back to another episode of the Top Dogs Podcast here on the Field of 68 Media Network. My name is Rob Doster. It's been a while since we talked to you guys about six months. The offseason was uh, it was actually kind of eventful for UConn fans and for the UConn basketball program, which is why I have my guy Jared Kotler coming on from the CT Scoreboard Podcast. We'll link that uh, his show down in the description below. We're going to talk everything about what happened this offseason with UConn. Um, give a little bit of a season preview, kind of set the the stage for some of our expectations to talk about a year that I think, Jared, I think it's fair to say a lot of UConn fans are excited about. Yeah, I think everyone's excited for for this season. I know the offseason got off to a really interesting note as we saw mm -hmm. not only UConn, but pretty much every team across college basketball going with some roster movement. But I know for the UConn fans, it's a little uh, anxious at first, but things just seem to really turn the corner here once you start to get some new guys in. And I think everyone's excited for this season. Yeah, what was your first reaction when you heard that Corey Floyd was transferring to Providence? I know, I know. I That was the one that I, really like got me at first. I'm like, he's going in conference. Uh, you know, he, the potential with Corey Floyd was just always there too. Um, but in Dan Hurley, we trust. And, uh, you know, he's brought in some new guys, and I, I, I think we'll get through it. Yeah, that one was uh, – it was a little bit strange. I thought that he had a – you know, a, a pretty decent ceiling, but there were some family ties to the Providence program. Yeah. And, you know, it, it is what it is. If you spend a year uh, red shirting and sitting on the bench and doing nothing but practicing and getting yelled at by Dan Hurley in practice, I, I can imagine where you're like, yeah, you know, maybe this ain't for me. You know, maybe I need to make a change. So that was, a, that was the thing that got me, though. Like, if you're going to red shirt for a year, like, and go through all that, why leave after that? But, you know, as you said, family ties and all that stuff. But teach their own and uh, wish them luck. Did any of the other transfers really worry you or bo bother you or, or have you concerned? No, not not terribly. I mean, I know everyone was clamoring for Rasul Diggins to get some time last year. Um, but you, you saw I went to UMass. I think it's going to be interesting there with, with Frank Martin now, the head coach there, to see what he could do with, with Rasul. Um, Jalen Gaffney, I know, went through some ups and downs last year. So that wasn't too much of a surprise. I think a cook caught me a little bit off guard. Um, I know the playing time might not have been there for him. So obviously hoping for the best. And he's been a bit of a different player since he came back from that injury. But I think once you saw the guys that Dan Hurley was able to bring in, I think it alleviated a lot of those fears there of in some of that anxiety that came with the guys that were transferring. And I think for me too, just as a fan, I, I think my mentality has had to start to shift a little bit in this college basketball landscape. I know Rob, you've been doing this for a while too, but you're used to seeing, especially at a program like UConn, where you're building a roster and you're having these guys from freshman year and they're staying for a while. Um, but I think just the way college basketball is now, I, I just don't think that's probably the case most likely for a lot of these guys going forward. I, I mean, I think that it will be. Um, I, I do think that you're going to have to accept the fact that there's going to be more transfers out and more transfers coming in. Like there, you're, you're going to have less of a time to prove yourself. Yeah. And I do think that when you look at some of the landing spots for some of the guys that left, um, I think it says a lot about who they are and whether or not they would the have potential. gotten some playing yeah. time. If you're not going to get playing time, you know, I've always been to the mindset where it's better to have 10 or 11 scholarship guys that know that they deserve minutes as opposed to filling out that 13 scholarship allotment. And then having guys sitting on the bench being upset, like that's never going to be good for anybody yeah. for team chemistry for anything. I think if you look at, you know, Villanova is the perfect example. They won two out of three titles and made, what was it, three out of five final fours yeah. by basically having nine or ten guys, nine or ten scholarship players every year. So um, it works, and I do think that we see a little bit of development. It's just – it's fast-tracked, right? Yeah, yeah. Like that's, we get, that's we get Jordan way. Hawkins coming in. He's going to – he has a good freshman year. He's going to have a breakout sophomore year, and then he's probably off to the NBA. James Booknight breaks out the end of his freshman year, comes back to school, goes on and becomes a lottery pick as a sophomore. Um, I think we're going to see more of that than we are going to see guys like Adama Sanogo hang around for two, three, four years. But yeah, you know, it's the new era of college basketball. You just got to you got to learn to love these guys a little bit quicker. I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just enjoy the ride while it's happening. Yep. Um, all right. A couple of programming notes before we talk about this actual team. I just want to let everybody know uh, you can purchase your copy of the Almanac at the link below. Um, it is $19.99. It is 800,000 words, literally 800,000 words. We cover uh, 814 pages and every single Division One basketball team gets a 1,300 word preview. Our merch store is linked below and you can also subscribe to the Field of 68 Daily. That is a free newsletter that comes out every morning, 8.30 a.m., Monday through Friday, all year round. If you're a college basketball junkie and you are not subscribed to that, uh, I don't know if you are actually a college basketball junkie. All right, let's talk about this upcoming season. Is UConn officially a football school, Jared? 
I know. I know like the big offseason talk was about Kentucky and Kentucky becoming a football school. I think we're seeing a shift now from all these basketball schools becoming football schools. I mean, knock off Fresno State, favored on the road at FIU. I don't, I don't know what world we're living in right now, um, but it, it makes for some fun stuff. I know Jim Moore is uh, a guy who's given in to the other UConn athletic programs. He's bought in on everything. So uh, nice, nice to have uh, some success there right now. We'll see what happens. Yeah. With the way that uh, the college football or the college sports landscape is going, having a good football program is actually really, really important. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. And so it's just, it's funny to me that like, you know, you have Kansas five and zero, and everyone's celebrating that Duke is yeah. four and oh, and everybody's celebrating that. And UConn happens to get a win over a mountain West team. And it's like the yeah. biggest deal in the state of Connecticut. So yeah. uh, good. I, I, I hope steps, that small steps, but we're getting there. Yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully. That's yeah. it. Um, all right. I, I want to start with this in all seriousness. I, let, let's start with like a 35,000 foot view here, right? As of today, it's 10 a.m. It's Tuesday. It's October 4th, uh, October 4th in the year of our Lord, 2022. I want to know how you feel about the state of UConn basketball right now, because when I talk to people that don't follow it on a daily basis, it, it, it seems like there's like, are, are you OK losing two first round games in a row? Are you OK with this? Are you OK with that? So I, I want to know where you stand on where this program is right now and where you feel like it's headed. Yeah, it, I'm pretty confident in the direction of the program right now. I mean, I don't think anyone wants to lose in the first round of the NCAA tournament, but I guess that's just the highs and lows of playing that style of tournament. UConn certainly has been on the better end of those things in the past, and I, I think it's a little bit newer losing in the the first round here, especially as you've seen more parity in college basketball, too. I think you're only going to see that happen more and more throughout these tournaments. We saw what St. Peter's did in the run they went on. So, I mean, it's not something I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with losing in the first round, but I still feel like this program is going in the right direction. And you've been seeing those building blocks each year that, that Coach Hurley's been here and progressively getting this team better and better. It's kind of crazy to me. I think one of the beat writers called out how when uh, they opened practice that this was the first practice that was entirely made up of Dan Hurley recruited players, which is kind of crazy when you think he's been here. This is going on his fifth year here. So, He's finally got his guys. Uh, you're seeing a huge uptick in the recruiting. I mean, we could talk about the Fab Five guys he's got coming in for, for next year, too. But I, I think when you look at what he's done this year, being back in the Big East, I think the Big East is going to be interesting, too, this year with so much turnover when it comes to coaching. I mean, and, and especially as these rosters can be rebuilt with the transfer portal. I think it's just going to make for a really interesting season. And I feel like the consistency in some of the guys that UConn carried over we're going to be those big difference makers for him, whether it's Andre Jackson, Adama Sinogo, Jordan Hawkins. You've got that nice core there that I think when you supplement it with those other pieces that they've got, guys they brought in from the portal, I think it makes for a really interesting team this year. Yeah, I think that he's building it the right way. Yeah. Right? Like he didn't go out and sell out and try to get all of these one and done guys. Um, he has... They, the, the staff has really made it a point to identify players that are a little bit under the radar, like a James Booknight, like a Jordan Hawkins, um, like a solo ball. Like a, I don't want to dive too deep into the recruiting class yeah. now because I'm going to save that for another podcast. But um, they've done a really good job at identifying high upside players that probably need a year or two or three in college and then will end up going on and having professional careers. And I think that uh, I'll make another comparison to Kansas, right? Like that's where Kansas has been at their best. Yeah, I talked with Bill Self about this in the off season. And like, he's, he basically said our best teams are when we have those top 75 guys that are 21 year old juniors that are yeah. now <laughs> first round picks and all Americans, as opposed to having one and done, one and done 19 year olds coming in and, and trying to play to that level. So I think that, that Dan's building it the right way. And I look, I, I beat this drum all season last season. You cannot overlook the fact that, A, when when Dan got the job, they were coming off back-to-back -back under 500 seasons in the AAC, finishing yeah. below like South Florida and East Carolina in, in the American, right? Think about where they were when he got the job, and now right. think about where we are right now. We're only being a top 25 team in every single metric known to, to mankind. Yeah. And only – being a five seed that loses in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Now it's like there's, I've had people be like, are you, do you think Dan Hurley's the right guy for the job? Like, are, yeah. are we putting him on a hot seat back to back tournaments? Is that what we're doing now? It's yeah, no, I, I think all that talk's crazy. I mean, I've been impressed again when, when you think about where the program was mm -hmm. when he came here, <clears throat> excuse me, to where it is today. I mean, it's, it, it's leaps and bounds. It's like, I know we talked about football, it's like you think about them losing 45 nothing to Fresno State last year and coming back and beating them this year. I'm really curious to see this team go out to Portland 
where I feel like was really the downfall of the Kevin Ollie era where they got run off the court, you know, by Arkansas and Michigan State. And it's like, now you get to see what this team can really do. You've got expectations for this team, which I think was missing for a while. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm really excited to see where this team can go. I think the potential is there. And I, I am a, unequivocally stand behind Dan Hurley here and think he's the right guy. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you there as well. You got to you got to let this thing play out. You can't uh, you can't try to reinvent the program and rebuild the program in the middle of of what really is a program build, right? And and the the honest truth is, if you're not Duke or Kentucky or Kansas, and I know some UConn fans think that we probably should be because we have as many national titles as them, but yeah, um, when you're not those blue blood programs, it's very hard to like rebuild like that it's also very hard to end up being a under 500 team in the american if you're one of those blue blood programs yeah Um, yeah i I do want to talk a little bit about the expectations and the pressure because i think that it's fair to say that hurley probably needs to get a tournament win at this point especially like if he ends up being a four or five six seed again like you you can't just keep losing in the first round um, but I yeah. also think it, it, it's important to know that like a seven seed losing in the first round, like is not an upset to a 10 seed. That's just like right. seven, 10, eight, nine. We all know those are coin flips. And then losing as a five to what the best mid major in the country in New Mexico state, when a guy whose literal name is Teddy buckets goes off for 37 and hits like seven ridiculous threes, you yeah. know, oh, only so much you could do. Like yeah. there's like that shit happens in the tournament. That's why we love the tournament because shit right. like that happens. And it just, you know, it is what it is. So I do think there is a level of pressure on Hurley, but I also think that when you are the head coach at UConn, where it's the fan sense. base expects seven yeah. seeds to win national titles, like I got a Kemba Walker jersey on right now. <laughs> you know why? Because Kemba took a three seed. They were a nine seed in the Big East tournament. They won the Big East tournament and won the national title that year, right? Like right. UConn yeah. fans, UConn fans think that happens every year instead of realizing, like, you know what? Those were two of the most incredible March runs ever, ever. in the history yeah. of the sport. Yeah, no, ag- agree wholeheartedly. I and I think those expectations are there, and I think. I think Dan Hurley's done a good job of not running away from those expectations. Mm-hmm. Like he's, he he's been, it. yeah, yeah. He, he's been open. Like this isn't what we were wanting to do here. Like when, you know, I, what was it last year when they had lost to Maryland and, you know, kind of choked that Creighton game away in the big East semifinals made up like the forty five oh seven shirts to basically say, we didn't show up for 45 minutes and seven seconds in those two games. Like he knows that they're expecting more. And I think now that he's, gotten a couple years in the Big East under his belt. He's got a full roster of his guys. He can play the style that maybe he hasn't been able to play under past teams with the rosters he's had. I, I think it sets things up nicely for this year, uh, for this team to really go and, and take that next step and, and be that first Hurley team that gets a win in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I, I hope so, man. I uh, Mostly just because I, I'm, I'm so sick of hearing everybody give me shit every time yeah. that they lose <laughs> that, yeah, that, I'm the same it's, way. it's less I, I don't care about the wins as much as i don't want to hear it from my friends when you yeah. lose is right yeah exactly exactly I, and then the providence fans on like I, I love the back and forth between uconn and providence like that i really really want that to become like a big uh regional rivalry where like there's bad blood well i don't think there will ever be bad blood between ed cooley and another human being <laughs> Um, but I want like th- I want that to be tension, right? Yeah. Yes, you know where. Remember how how it was every time we played Syracuse. Yeah, like, yeah, ex- yeah. We, we need that replace. I need that in my life. I need, need to hate some someone. Buzz. Yeah, yeah. Hey, well, they. I know. I know they're from the UConn side. Everyone thinks they ducked them uh, last year with the COVID <laughs> with the COVID uh, pause there. So uh, you know, sets sets things up a little bit. Maybe they play twice this year, or maybe three times. Even get to see things uh, play out there. We can't. We can't let that die. We got to keep it going. It, it just needles <laughs> Providence fans so much. I love it. It's so funny. yeah, yeah, um, no, no. All right. So you mentioned the UConn roster. Let, let's dive into it a little bit and let's talk about because there are some things that I really, really like, and there's places where I think that this team is going to take a big step forward. And there's also some kind of concerns that I have about the way that this thing is built, and I think some things that might limit what our ceiling could end up being. So I want to start with this. Adama Sonogo, preseason Big East Player of the Year. Is that fair? Would yeah. you have him there? Yeah, I think I would. I would. I think I would. I mean, he showed what he could do. I know he kind of uh, got a little bit gassed towards the end of the season last year, and he admitted it. But, I mean, you see the clips they've thrown out there, and you see him jacking up some threes now. If he can add that to his game, I mean, I think he's a player that he's just built for success at the college game, I think. Mm-hmm. 
Breaking news. The Field of 68 has an online store, and it's your one-stop shop for the latest and greatest merch in college basketball and college football. You can find shirts to support your favorite team, make fun of your rival team, or boast Field of 68 catchphrases like Daddy Brad, Cussing and Discussing, and the Star Heels. Go to www.fieldof68.shop today and enter promo code TOUCHDOWN for 20% off at checkout. Yeah, he needs to be a little bit of a better finisher. Yeah. I'd love to see him take a step as a passer out of the post, be able to make yeah. reads a little bit quicker. But I mean, he's going to, he was a 16 to nine guy before he got tired at the end of the year. And I do think, um, I talked with Hurley about this in the offseason. I think the addition of Donovan Klingon is going to yeah. be so massive because they can go to him and still run all the same stuff that they run with Dama out there. And they can use the Dama 25, 26, 27 minutes and play Donovan 10, 12, 14. Yeah, and you're still you're not going to have as big of a drop off as you did last year, and I think that it will be incredibly important to keeping his legs, uh, his legs, um, not what's the opposite, his legs in shape. Like he's going to yeah. have his legs at the end of the year. Yeah, and, and and I think the one thing that we've seen with Adama during his time at UConn, when they've kind of like keyed in on a couple areas with him, he's shown that he's quick study and he can really pick up on these things. So I think passing out of the post probably one of the big focal points for him coming out of that offseason and, and I think what you mentioned too about finishing around the rim in the clips you've seen he's been dunking it a lot more which is something that you want to see a little bit more out of him like go, go down with that like no need to you know kind of pump fake as much like just go hammer it down I think everyone likes to see that so I, I'm expecting big things from Sonogo this year and I think your point on Klingon is huge I mean I don't know if you saw the picture from the Big East freshman days where he's standing next to Emeka Okafor, and he makes Okafor <laughs> look like he's my height. I mean, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be cool to see the two of them out there. I had flashbacks of seeing uh, Rebecca Lobo standing next to Russ Steinberg. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, look, your your point about dunking it is is I think really really salient because he he is six eight and he's two sixty and he's burly and he's physical and he crashes yeah. the glass and like at his core he's also like a finesse player right yeah like, like yeah, much about like soccer yeah it's like he's got great footwork he's got really nice touch going to his right hand uh, i think he thinks he has really nice touch going to his left hand <laughs> um he's got to develop that a little bit but it's a lot of like jump hooks and baby hooks and fadeaways yeah. or just like dude you're bigger than it go, go through his chest just, put your yeah, elbow it's... under his chin and go up and finish on him right and i think that yeah. that was uh, my understanding is that was a little bit of a point of emphasis this offseason with him. So, yeah, yeah I, I'm I'm with you on that point. Um, okay. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think, like, uh, you know, if you look at UConn Twitter, I think one of the biggest complaints about this team last year was just their inability to finish at the rim. Like, they, they'd be able to get right to the rim. They'd blow a layup, botch, you know, put back or what. So I, I think that dunking, especially for him, Sonogo, is going to be big for this team going forward. Yeah, it's uh... – yeah, I made that point so many times last year. The yeah, the biggest problem I had with 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 UConn last year, I don't know what I'll say it was the biggest problem, but the biggest concern I had with them throughout the season was just the self inflicted stuff, right? Yeah, Andre Jackson throwing a, a the, on a two on one, throwing a fast break pass into the twenty seventh row. Um, Adama, what, how many layups did he miss? Yeah, in the in the Villanova game, um, in the uh, in the Big East, uh, yeah, in the Big East, yeah. like how many did he miss right around the rim that would have changed? It was a three point game. Right. Probably missed four in the second half. Right. Um, it was just it was stuff like that. And I do think that uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping they will be better at fixing yeah. some of that stuff. But let's talk about let's talk about Andre Jackson, because I think at the end of the day, there's two things that this team needs that I, like, I have real concerns about. One of them is the three point shooting mm -hmm. and one of them is the playmaking, especially in the half court. Um, and I think that Andre is kind of critical to both of those things being able to work out because of his ability to kind of be a point forward and the fact that, you know, his, he's got a jump shot that looks like a six year old. Right. So how, where do you, where do you stand on him? What are you hoping to see out of him? And, and what do you think his role will end up being? Yeah. I, I think last year was a really good step forward for him where they started to let him be a little bit more of that playmaker. So he's able to get that experience last year that I think should hopefully you know, bode well for him this year. And, and, you know, you mentioned it just before, like you see him on the fast break and he like, he knows what he wants to do with it. Everything was just seemed to be sped up just a little bit too much where he was maybe a step ahead of everyone. So I think this year getting some more familiarity with these guys on the roster, um, 
having some other playmakers too, having some guys who hopefully can shoot the ball, I think make a big difference too. So I'm looking for big things for, for Andre Jackson. I know Dan Hurley made him a captain, something he hasn't done in past years with captains. So, I mean, you, you talk about when the guys transfer and some of the quotes out of Andre Jackson were like, like we mean business. Like the guys here like want to win. Like we, we stayed here to tough it out. And, and I think playing with a little bit of a chip on his shoulder there too. I mean, I know we, we all kind of laugh at the shooting motion, you know, Lonzo ball like or what, but he, he still shot like what, maybe 35, 36% last year from three. Um, I, I think was about that number. So if he can improve with some consistency, I know he was in the forties for most of the season. Oh, okay. I'm going to bring it up right now. He finished the year at 36%. He was in okay. the forties for most of the year. Yeah. It, and I mean, it's hard to, uh, judging an off season but when you're looking for like any glimmers of hope in the off season you turn to instagram stories or whatever and you, you see some of the clips he posted from his workout sessions where he's just like draining threes and you're like yeah hey, maybe he could do it i mean we'll, we'll see what he could do during, well, during he, games, he also but... he doesn't need to be ray allen yeah right? no like, he, he needs just to the be threat. someone yeah he needs to be someone where defenses have to run him off the line yeah right he needs to be a good enough shooter where defenses are like, oh shit, I can't let him stand out there and have eight seconds to shoot a wide open three because he'll yeah, shoot, exactly. they'll hit them at 40%, right? That's all he has to be. He doesn't have to be able to hit pull ups because he's not going to need to pull up at the college level, right? Like yeah. he's, he's got, if you get the three point line, pump fake, one dribble, he's dunking it on your head. Yeah, exactly. Actually, he's probably not because Andre Jackson never ever dunks unless it's one. <laughs> See, I think like uh, that, that has to be the thing that we want to see out of this team this year is dunking. Yeah, it, get to the rim and put it on someone's head. Yeah, that's what you need to do. I need, I need more of this. In, yeah, in basketball. Hey, we got the athleticism. Do it. Yeah, um, I, I think, I, I think we'll talk about Jordan Hawkins in a second. But about, I, I think his combination with with Tristan Newton, yeah, is going to be what determines if UConn is like okay, they actually have a chance to play with Creighton and Villanova and Xavier at the top of the Big East, or like they're just another top 25 team that's going to get to the tournament. And if they can get to the second weekend, it's been a great season. I think it's it's it, those two because RJ, I don't, people nationally did not realize how important he was to UConn and how yeah. good he was, especially down the stretch of the season, man. Like he made, he made every right play. He was five foot nine. He had defenses geared towards him because everybody knew he was the only guy he that was going to make yeah. something happen once like, the, the UConn, what they love to do is like run all of this false motion and then try to get one guy in one action where you create a shot coming out of this action, right? And when all of that broke down, the guy that they just gave it to and said, go make something happen was RJ Cole. Yeah. And everybody knew it was only going to be RJ Cole and everyone was able to collapse on him. So it was what he was able to do. Like, I, I think UConn is like a bubble team without RJ yeah. Cole being a first team all big East player last season. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's an interesting point there. And he, he, as you mentioned, he, he did do everything for this team last year. And I think it might have been a little underappreciated at times, too, when you think about all that went into it. And I, I'm glad for at least for his sake, he had that big moment at home against Villanova where mm -hmm. he really was able to get that that big game winner there. Because I think I think it's tough, especially when you think of a guy like RJ. And we've talked about expectations at UConn, undersized point guard, and like everyone assumes you're automatically going to be at Kemba Shabazz level. And uh, they throw those expectations on you, and it's just tough. Um, but I, I think what you saw from RJ, and I, I hope he tears it up in Greece right now. I, I think that's where he he ended up. Uh, but I think it's going to be interesting when you when you talk about some of those guys that are going to surround Andre Jackson this year. I think this year the team has a little bit more depth than they have in, in years past. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see what those pieces can do, especially a lot of these new pieces. A guy I'm interested to see, and I know he, he had some success at San Diego shooting-wise, was Joey Calcaterra. So I think if you could throw a guy like him out there, I, I know uh, Nahima Lean was able to do it. Virginia Tech is a pretty good shooter as well. I, I think it opens things up a little bit more as you see the potential in these shooters out there. You know, can they live up to that potential of what they can do from three? It's going to be a whole nother story. But it, at least you've got that potential there, I think, with this team in yeah. terms of how you're going to want to run offense this year. Alex, Alex Caravan, too. He's yeah. going to he is going to be one, a chucker and two, a guy that I think is, is makes like 42% from three and he's six, eight and he's versatile and he's been there for a semester already. He, he I think he's going to start. I, I, yeah, no, I, I, I'd like to see that too. I mean, I, I think what this UConn team has missed over the past few years is a guy who can just consistently knock down threes. And I, I don't have any issues with Chuck and like Chuck, Chuck, Chuck away. I mean, if you, you got Sonogo under there to, to clean things up or you got Klingon under there, you can, you can make things work. 
But Caravan's game, I think, is going to be interesting. And I do think that being there last year for that semester, I think, is a big time, big time uh, benefit to him and the team there. Yeah. So the there's the two things I, I mentioned earlier. The two things that I'm really concerned about are the shot making to create yeah. space for either drivers or Adama working in the paint, Adama and Donovan. Um, and two is like the the point guard play. So I think that it yeah. kind of works in concert, right? If you have guys like Alex Caravan and guys like Joey Calcaterra and guys like Naheem Aline that are able to come off of those screens and make shots um, that are able to force defenses to respect them and guard them on the perimeter, then it, that just opens oh, everything. Oh, yeah, and it completely. makes life so much easier for Tristan Newton, who like he averaged 17, five and five at East Carolina last year. And from what I've heard is not, he he's he hasn't been blowing people away so far, right? And I think there's a lot of pressure on him to come in and and, and fill the shoes that RJ Cole had. Yeah. And I don't I, I want to kind of temper those expectations. To me, he is a guy that if you can get him averaging 11 points, 11 or 12 points, four and a half assists, and making 38% from three, that's what you need out of him. Yeah. I don't I think he's going to step in and be a first team all big East player. And I hope that that's not what the expectation is. Yeah, and as I mentioned, I think you're the point guard at UConn. You automatically get a bunch of high expectations thrown at you. And I think, though, the way this team is constructed this year, there are just so many different pieces that you don't need him to be the guy that's going to go out and put up 20 points a game as a point guard. I don't think you need that. I think what you mentioned there, you know, you can, you know go 12-4. And I, I think you're in a good spot there with him. I'm going to be interested to see what he, what he can do. I know he tore up UConn for a game when he was at East Carolina. Uh, so you saw the potential there. Obviously, a step up in competition, but I, I think it's going to be interesting to see how he can mix with those pieces there. How much is Dan Harley going to throw Andre Jackson and let him be that point forward type guy that they've shown that they're willing to do with him? I think there are just a, a number of different combinations you could throw out there. I know you mentioned Caravan starting. I think the combinations of guys you could throw out on the court at any given time, like you could just have a bunch of different combinations there, and it's going to make just for some really interesting lineups that I think. Again, if these guys can live up to their potential, they're going to make UConn uh, hard to guard and really open things up a bit. Yeah, I, I'm I'm really looking forward to a lineup where you have Tristan Newton, six foot five, yeah. at the like air quotes one. You have Jordan Hawkins, six six at the two. Andre Jackson, six eight, whatever he is, six six, six seven. You have Alex Caravan out there. You have four guys that can really get out and guard, that are switchable, that can play different positions, that are long and athletic. And I think yeah. that is what the best Dan Hurley teams are defensively. Like they just, they make it difficult to run stuff against them. Yeah. And I think that we have a team that will be able to do that. Now it would be nice if Adama was, you know, the like Walker Kessler, right? If he was like the best shot blocker on the planet and someone that can switch out onto um, a five, uh, a point guard as a five man. Um, but if he was that, then he wouldn't be at UConn as a junior, yeah. right? Like it yeah. just kind of is what it is. So I think he, he's, he's not bad. He's going to be a good enough rim protector. He's going to be good enough, to be able to switch ball screens and play drop. And um, I, I think it'll be fine. All right. We haven't talked about Jordan Hawkins yet. Yeah. No, Let, I, let's talk about him. Oh, real quick. One thing I do want to say, Asan Diara, I've heard good things about him. And I do think that the change of pace that you can get from him at the point guard spot, where you have someone that's a little bit more direct and aggressive <laughs> and going to the basket and kind of like, Going like going uh, 110 percent at all times, I think is going to be a nice addition as well. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point too. And I think if you have a reliable point guard that can come off the bench and do those type of things, I think is big because I think as you saw last year, and, and you mentioned it with with RJ having to really just weather the full load uh, come the come the end of games that type of situation there. And he was, I'm, I'm sure, he was gassed a bit down towards the end of the stretch when when everything was going towards him. Um, and there were times where just what you were getting out of Jalen Gaffney wasn't what you were expecting out of a point guard to kind of give him a little bit of a breather. There were times where like you felt like you couldn't have RJ off the court at all pretty much. So I think if you can have a guy like Hassan Diar out there to, to be able to give Tristan uh, a little bit of a breather or whoever else might be out there to, to give them some time and help and spread those minutes out a little bit. Too, yeah. right? Give it a different look too, right? Give it a different look. You know, teams are going to prepare for what it's going to be when you have Tristan Newton who is going to do certain things and you're going to have Andre Jackson do certain things yeah. and um, UConn's going to run offense a certain way when those guys are out there. And then you bring in Asan DR who plays a completely different style and I think it'll make things – it'll make it a little bit more difficult to prepare for and a little bit more difficult to guard. So I'm, I think he'll be a good addition as well. And I'm, I'm excited about yeah. Naheem Aline, who's just like the perfect 3 and D piece, right? Yeah. You, you want a guy that can guard. You want a guy that can space the floor. You got him in Naheem Aline. All right, Jordan Hawkins. Set 
give me give me your level of of what your expectation is for what he can be this season. Yeah, I mean, I was so impressed just seeing him, just seeing his shooting motion. I know you talked about Andre Jackson's earlier, but I feel like every time I saw Jordan Hawkins put up a shot, like it was going in. Like he he could brick it off the side of the backboard, but the the motion just looks so pure and so sweet that I I think it just raises his game to such a level where if he's consistently knocking down shots, um, I mean, he's a difference maker and he's gone after this year. I think what you saw in that Georgetown game too, where he was dunking on guys, like he finally started to build some of that confidence. It, it seemed like early in the season, he kind of got in his own head a little bit. Like he had that turnover in the Auburn game in the Bahamas and kind of beat himself up over it for a little bit, it seemed. And he just never seemed to necessarily get his confidence back. He never had that the early handle. Part. That's what it yeah. was. It was never the hand. Like he – my understanding from from conversations with the staff is that what he's worked on this summer is one like adding a bunch of upper body strength. So when he goes to yeah. the basket, he can kind of take he doesn't get bumped off his lines. He can kind of get to his spot. Um, and two was just the developing confidence in his ability to dribble the ball. Yeah, and that sounds like really basic, but that you could very clearly see that he didn't like he he expected that he was going to turn it over when he was dribbling last season when he was bringing yeah. the ball up against pressure. And I don't think that'll be the case this year. And I do also think that they are going to put him in a lot of – so when Tyler Tyler Polly last year, all of those double screens he ran off of, all of those actions mm-hmm. that where they just tried to get him running into an open three, that's going to be all Jordan Hawkins Perfect. this yeah. season. No, I, I think, as I said, with his motion, like if, if you could get him into those into those positions, I think it's it, – I mean, the level for this team just goes up a whole nother degree there. And again, in that Georgetown game, it really had seemed like he had really put everything together. Like, I know he's from the area, so he's playing, you know, balling out there. But just to have that confidence in the scene in him, like, uh, he was a guy, like, I feel like if UConn had him back for that New Mexico State game, I think it goes the other way. I think they were just a piece short in that game, and he's a guy who could have done something there. I, I know I know, it's hard to say that when Teddy, Look, Teddy when, Buckets. When, when Teddy Buckets is doing things like Teddy Buckets was doing, like there's, there, I, yeah, I just don't think UConn was going to win that game. Like That was just not in the cards. It, just, yeah. it, it is what it is. Unless you're going to send five guys to guard one, like it just, <laughs> whatever, it happens. I'm going to pretend that it didn't and, yeah. and just ignore it. Um, That's fair. I think Jordan Hawkins needs to be, if UConn is going to, be a team that can compete for the Big East title, right? And not just be like, you know, third or fourth place, couple games. Like I'm talking really yeah. compete for the Big East title. Creighton, look, Creighton's going to be awesome this year, right? I know that Villanova doesn't have um, Justin Moore for a while and, and Jay Wright's not going to be there, but Caleb Daniels is a stud. Uh, Eric Dixon is a stud and Cam Whitmore like might be a top five pick. Yeah. Like they're, they are really, they're really loaded. Good. Yeah. And they're going to, they're, they're only going to get better when Justin Moore gets back and is healthy, like at the end of January. Um, Xavier, I know Zach for mantle is suspended, but Xavier, like they got a couple of really good freshmen, a kid, Des Claude from new Haven. Um, they're going to be really, really good this year. They, I think that the big East coaches poll had them pick second this year. Uh, so yeah. the, there's the top four in the big East are really, really good. And that's to say nothing of Providence who reloaded Seton hall, oh. who brought Shaheen Holloway in like the, the top of the big East is going to be really, really good. So if UConn is actually going to compete for a big East regular season title, I think Jordan Hawkins needs to be a 16 to 17 point per game guy. Adama Sonogo needs to be a 17 to 10 guy. And then yeah. all of those other pieces around them need to be shooting 35% from three. You need Andre Jackson to take a step forward. You need Tristan Newton to be really good. Like there's, they, yeah, but they need, they need those two stars to be stars. A- a- agree wholeheartedly there. I, I think you're you're spot on in, in saying what this team needs to do to compete at that top level of the Big East. And I think I think though really for one of the first times under this Dan Harley team though, you could see the potential with the other pieces there and see that there is that possibility where if these guys can play at the level you're expecting, even if they're maybe a little bit less than, than what you're expecting in terms of your expectations going into this season, I, I think that really just opens up so many possibilities for this team. So I, I think it's going to be interesting to see, but no doubt you need those stars to perform night in and night out if you're going to compete at the top of the Big East here. Because as you mentioned, it, it, it's going to be tough. Yeah. There. So the I think the best thing about this group this season is that there's basically two guys at every position. Right? Yeah. Like one thing that Dan Hurley has really, really stressed this entire offseason is that they, we have depth, right? So if, let's just say like, Tristan Newton's playing like shit one game. It's like, all right, we like, you're you're out. You know, we got yeah. a sign. Go get in there. 
Andre, go take over the point. We'll get Naheem in there, right? If Naheem's not making shots, get Joey Calcaterra in there. If Alex Caravan isn't playing well, well, you know what? We're going to move Andre Jackson to the four and we'll play two guards with Jordan Hawkins at the three, right? If Adama's playing like ass, Donovan Klingon's going to get in there. So there's there's two guys at every position, and we haven't even talked about Samson Johnson. I was just going to say that, yeah. Like, who still is a guy, like he's he's got – you want to talk about like X Factor or whatever it is? Like I, that I feel like he's the yeah, he's the big wild card of this team, I feel like. Like yeah, I've seen some people that have projected him to start. It's like I mean I mean Dan Hurley hyped him up coming into his freshman year. I think talked about him as a, a banner guy in the uh, all potential. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean you come in with those expectations there. And I think it was kind of hit or miss in what you saw out of him last year. He showed some flashes in the few minutes he got. But I mean, I, I'm excited to see what he can do because he's a guy if, with his size and if he can stretch the floor, I mean, it's, I think it's a difference maker. When it comes to natural ability, and I'm saying this knowing the fact that Andre Jackson is on that team, I think it's fair to say that Samson Johnson has like the most natural ability. The problem is, and, and this was a direct, like this was an on the record quote that Hurley gave me for the Almanac. Mm-hmm is that Samson Johnson will have moments where he looks like a lottery pick and then he'll go 20 minutes where you don't even realize that he's actually still on the floor in practice, right? Like, I think it's the it's the consistency of kind of – I think part of it is he doesn't realize how good he is yet. And I think once that clicks, it'll kind of get there. He probably has a ways to go to get there. And he is also – you know, we talked about this earlier, the guy that can kind of develop and grow into being – exactly one of these these stars right so maybe it's a two-year thing maybe it's a three-year thing maybe he doesn't get there till he's a senior um but he's got the 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 ceilings there so uh let's wrap it up with this all right i want to know what your what oh there goes my phone what is your uh what is the ceiling for this group what do you think is a reasonable level of expectation like where would you be like okay this is what we should go in saying this the this is the barometer for a successful season yeah and where's what's the floor for you going out and waving the pitchforks and standing outside of the UConn athletic director's office with a sign that says fire Dan Hurley all right I want each one of those levels so what is the ceiling what do you think the same ceiling is ceiling I mean I, I feel like consistently like this is like a top 25 team throughout the year I think in terms of ceiling like being in that 10 to 15 range, I think would kind of impress me in terms of, you know, what they put together there. Um, I think that ultimately results in at least a, a couple NCAA tournament wins that, I mean, I think the bare minimum for this year is you got to get a win um, in the NCAA tournament. But I, I think the ceiling for this team, like, I mean, the way college basketball is, and as we've seen in this tournament, it probably should be at least a sweet 16 for this team. So I, I think that, this team is good enough to like at least at the bare minimum compete for a big East regular season title yeah. and get to a final four. I think that there's enough talent on this roster to be able to do that, but that hinges on one Jordan Hawkins having a breakout year. Yeah. Two Andre Jackson having a breakout year three Tristan Newton being able to adjust to a level up, which is never an easy thing to do when you transfer and four guys like a Diara and Alex Caravan and Samson Johnson and Donovan Klingon coming in and having an impact at a level that they've never played at before, right? Or in a bigger role than they've ever been in before. Joey Calcaterra, you could throw him in there as well. Um, So I think that, I think it's possible for those things to happen. I think that's what the ceiling is, but there's a lot of like ifs and that that a lot of things need to go right for that to be what happens and for us to get there. So I would say, like I said, ceiling is they can win the Big East in theory. They can make a Final Four in theory. I think that the reasonable expectation should be you got to get a win in the tournament. Well, first yeah. of all, you got to make the tournament. You got to get a win in the tournament. Um, you have to be able to uh, make noise in the Big East regular season. Like I'm 14 and six. I think I'd be pretty satisfied with that. Like finish yeah. top four, right? Finish in the, the top four range somewhere around there. Make a little bit of noise in the Big East tournament. Um, win a game in the NCAA tournament. And I, I would be more than satisfied with that season. Yeah, I, I think the one thing for me this year, I'd love to see this team make that next step and get it get into the Big East championship game when when it comes to, to tournament time at MSG. I feel like they've come so close to just being on the cusp of things in that semi game. I know when we, we talked earlier, the top four in the Big East is going to be tough. And if you ended up being in that top four and you don't make a championship game, you probably lost to a pretty good team there. But I think getting to, to be in that Big East tournament championship game would be a huge step forward for this team yeah uh yeah absolutely i would love to be able to see that there's nothing 
absolutely nothing better than Madison Square Garden when it's UConn against another Big East foe, when it's yeah. loud, when it's packed, when you have that environment, when when all of those things. My favorite thing about the Big East tournament is you're just walking down the street and it's like, oh, yeah, that's the Providence bar. Yeah, yeah. that's the UConn bar. Yeah, that's where all the Creighton fans are. Yeah, that's where all the Villanova fans are. And then all of a sudden, everyone just kind of converges on the street at the same time. And you just have this mob <laughs> of drunk people walking down the street in the cold and the slush. And like the the, yeah. the nasty ass like streets of the, the, that are right around that New York City air, air yeah, yep. that, yeah. that beautiful city air with the the sound of the subways going underneath your feet. Um, there's nothing better. It's it that is the absolute best moment um, for the the Big East tournament. So yeah, I would love to see him there too. Um, what, what is the floor like? What 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 is the the bare minimum that you need to see for this team to be able to for you not to raise hell and go nuts like half of UConn Twitter does anytime. Yeah. That I guess like just make the tournament and just kind of keep places where they were last year. Um, I think that'd be disappointing if that's where they ended up again. I mean, if they end up in an eight, nine game and we're saying there's only so much you could do about that. It's a coin flip, but I think, you know, the floor for me this year would be like, Hey, like at least make the tournament. I mean, what, what, what do you think is like worst case in terms of a floor of the biggies, like top six, maybe like that's, that's where you end up just outside that top four, which I think would be disappointing. Um, but in terms of the floor, that's kind of where I see things. Yeah, I, I do think that once you get to like four through seven in the Big East this year, I think it's going to be one of those seasons where you're looking at like the, whoever's in seventh place is 10 and 10 and whoever ends up in fourth place is like 11 and nine or 12 and eight. Yeah. So it's going to look awful in the standings and it's going to be really difficult but, rankings, but it's good. It's going to end be up being like, yeah, yeah, it'll be like one or two possessions difference in close yeah. games. We're on team one on one team loss. So I'm a little less concerned about the ranking in the big East. It's more, you got to get to the tournament, right? Yeah. Like if they end up in the NIT and this program takes a step backwards, then it's when it's kind of like, okay, maybe the message is getting lost here. Maybe yeah. something is not working out, but I, I do not see that. being. No, I don't either. No. I do not see that being a problem. Um, all right. Well, listen, man, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I am Thanks I'm for fired me. up for the season. I can't wait to get it started. Um, I, I don't I don't think I'm going to go out to Portland, but, uh, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying to find ways to convince my wife that me not being around for Thanksgiving is probably a good <laughs> idea. So we'll see. I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm saving the chip for uh, Maui next year. I'm oh, like, Port- yeah, I'm like, it'd be a little bit of a better trip for me than, than Portland. I know uh, UConn Twitter was arguing over the beach stuff this offseason. I'm, I'm, I'm a beach guy, so give, give, give me that over Portland. <laughs> yeah, that was unacceptable. <laughs> what, what, are we, what are we doing? Like, I, I can understand if you don't necessarily want to go and like sit on the beach for six hours at a time, but how do you not love like just going to whether well, maybe you're just walking down the boardwalk. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Or what if you're you're sitting in a nice restaurant and you're overlooking the ocean and you're just at nothing, the, nothing you're better. In that yeah. beach community. Like what are, what are we doing here? Yeah. No, that's it's what happens when you get upset in the tournament and have a long off season. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have a football team to root for until now. Yeah. Until yeah. now. Until exactly. now. It, it, you know what's crazy? Of all of the things that have happened on the boneyard and all of the things that have happened on Utah, Yukon Twitter, the one moment when I was like, hey, you know what? This is these guys are a little bit too embarrassing for me is when they started talking about the beach not being fun. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it took, it took to that. So, Hey, you, you hung in for a while. You hung in for a yep. while. Well, listen, man, I appreciate the time. Everybody, if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to the CT scoreboard podcast. And uh, Jared, I'm going to have you on. I'm going to put you in the rotation, man. Maybe, yeah, uh, thanks. maybe some live reactions after games. Maybe we'll do something. I don't know. I love it. Let's do it. I'm excited, man. I'm fired up through the season. Go yeah, Huskies. Can't wait. Let's do it.